Founded in 1840, the Liverpool Collegiate School was a magnificent example of a Victorian public school. Liverpool Collegiate had a reputation of a standard of excellence that was supreme. 120 years later, however, it was closed after a fire swept through the main hall. Today, former teachers and pupils return to reminisce about their school days in a building which has now been transformed into luxury flats. We were expected to have read 50 or 60 original works in each language. I gather that's not the case today. <laughs> He started off by saying, you're now uh, going to have sex education. One of the boys said, what is it you would like to know, sir? <laughs> Taffy Jones was there from 1942 to 1951. Well, this takes me back 50 odd years. Uh, the school motto, not only in intelligence, but in goodness too. It, it's hard to describe what a, a fearful experience it was when you were 11 and a half, arriving in this building. It was dark, cavernous, quite easy to get lost. You were really quite terrified. But then, of course, you, you got your mates and you made friends with people. And there were a lot of staff who were terrific teachers, not just academic teaching. You had this terrific feeling for, for, for the, the staff and they for you. A pupil before Taffy's time was William Edward Popjoy. Well, I went to the Collegiate from 1932 when I was just 11. Grammar schools were fee paying. Uh, it doesn't sound much, it was five pounds a term, but the, the average wage was about 42 shillings a week. Now, when we wrote essays, the criticism was extremely severe. Uh, I had only just started the sixth form course when I was hauled out and asked to read out my essay. I didn't get further than the second word. I was torn to shreds and uh, so it went on. And each of the staff in each of the subjects uh, insisted uh, that the work should be rigorously planned. And you didn't use one word more than was absolutely necessary, but a very good discipline. Now the thing was that we had the time to read very widely. We were expected before we went to university to have read 50 or 60 original works in each language. Uh, I gather that's not the case today. <laughs> ah, now that wasn't originally there. That was in the headmaster's room. We just finished our exams in the sixth form. We were all leaving school. That summer, the Great West Indies side was touring England. About 10, 11 of us played hooky. Uh, unfortunately, as we looked along the seating, who did we see there but Pat Neen, the vice principal, uh, and several other members of staff. So the next day we were hauled in before the headmaster. He didn't shout at us or anything. He simply said, now look, I suppose you all think it was worth it. I believe um, Frank Waddle's century was something of great beauty. When we got outside, we thought, what a great headmaster we have and what a great school we go to. But a secure and privileged existence of both masters and pupils was about to be disrupted. War was on the horizon. Well, I went to school, the collegiate school, in 1938. It was a significant day. That was the year the gas masks arrived in school, the fear of war, the period in the late autumn when Chamberlain was going over uh, to Germany. Not a pleasant experience, I can assure you. This was a different world. It was a world where 
we were obviously going to be at war. And then during the war, of course, we had one or two women teachers. They were very good, as it happened, and there was no reason why they shouldn't be. But of course you realise that uh, during the war and until just after the war, if a woman got married, she could no longer teach. After the war, of course, all these young teachers came back trailing clouds of glory, as you might say. I always felt that there was a, a closer, uh, how should we put it, liaison between the boys and these staff that came back from the war because, by and large, their attitude had been obviously formed by the war and it was very difficult to, to get really upset about a boy turning up three minutes late for a lesson when you just come back from so a bloody battle somewhere in North Africa or something like that. In 1946, William Edward Popjoy returned to the Collegiate as a teacher. I had a letter from the new headmaster at the Collegiate, Gibbs, and Gibbs wrote to me and asked if I would come along and teach two or three lessons as their German master had gone back to the Sudetenland. And uh, I went along and stayed for 10 years. As an illustration, I was appointed at a salary of £375 a year with a first class degree. And uh, one of the bureaucrats in the education office noticed that I had been released from the army rather late in the first term. So my salary was reduced by £5 a year. <laughs> <laughs> and then there was a special allowance for a first class degree in those days of £15 a year <laughs> and that was taken away too. <laughs> there were 80 masters, most of them had uh, first from Oxford or Cambridge. Discipline on the whole was outstanding. You felt that every day you walked into the school, the door was being opened to knowledge. Ah, I remember this well. This was where the vice principal, the VP or the Viper, the legendary Pat Neen, had his room. Now he was the hitman because he was the one who was responsible for administering corporal punishment. People weren't caned very often, and it had to be for really the more serious offences. Where discipline was concerned, you either had it or you didn't, uh, and he had it. There were some teachers who could just walk in the room, and that was it. Um, other teachers who had to fight and struggle for, for discipline. And, uh, but what a terrific history teacher. He didn't sort of hammer you into learning dates and learning battles and things like this. He was more interested in, in you understanding uh, why people behaved the way they did, who the people were. People were history to him, not, not dates. And everything came to life. And I went on myself to be a history teacher. And I owed a lot of it to people like Pat Neen. These were devoted men. These were people who were teaching me. And the significant thing is they stayed. The headmaster of the school, for the most part, stayed 20 years. There were masters who were there for 45 years. There was continuity. Well, I'm standing where the chemistry lab used to be smells and stinks would emanate from it during experiments and I'm always amazed that people uh, weren't gassed literally. On the opposite, on the other side, was the biology lab presided over by a very small um, teacher called Mr Yerbury, a brilliant teacher. Nobody could imagine Yerbury actually teaching about sex education. But he got a young teacher and a young assistant uh, who was obviously lumbered with the job. He started off by saying, you're now uh, going to have uh, a sex lesson. One of the boys said, what is it you would like to know, sir? 
<laughs> it threw him completely off his stride and he went red and I think he felt that probably <laughs> all of us sitting there did know more about it than him. In the mid-1940s, a local school merged with the Liverpool Collegiate. And it became more and more difficult to recruit people. And of course there was a certain amount of dissatisfaction. But still, standards were maintained uh, for, for quite some time. Then, as free secondary education became a rights for all, the fee-paying grammar school came under threat. By the 1960s, admissions at the collegiates were to be non-selective, and the focus of the school began to shift. It was declining through no fault of its own, but by a maverick local authority that thought that it was a centre of excellence and everybody's got to have the same. If you have boys and girls uh, who are not in the top flight of ability, you have to temper the wind to the shorn lamb. On the other hand, the inspector will come in and say that you are expecting too little of them, you see. So you're not going to win. By 1973, the Liverpool Collegiate had been made a comprehensive, and the ethos of the school changed. I stopped outside the Collegiate, and I walked into the office, and there was a, a sort of young lady who seemed very nervous, and then she closed the door, and she locked it. I said, you have to lock it? It's with the kids inside. If they saw the door open, they'd come in here and they'd throw everything around. I thought, what's going on here? By this time, the school had only 300 pupils, a huge difference from the 1,100 that used to be under its roof. Now this was the octangle building which contained the hall. In the basement were the dining rooms where the boys had their meals uh, and in fact it was sadly an electrical fault uh, in the kitchens which set this alight and destroyed it. The final nail in the coffin was a fire in 1985 which destroyed both the kitchens and the main hall. With this, the school closed down. The, the balconies were made of teak, actually, and dry as a bone. I mean, I did, I'd been there since 1843, and that really accounted for the fact the way the fire spread so, so rapidly when it came. The building stood empty for a decade before property developers turned it into over 90 flats. Not even schools can endure forever, and the collegiate unfortunately ended. Thank you.